There's a part of me that thinks this is just overdone. People are tired of, of hearing really? about it. This guy was having real serious severe depression. Every time he'd go to like a Maulana or an Islamic scholar, uh, he was like advised, you know. There's a memory that I have that, let's say it's 11 years ago. It's really minor, but it's kind of haunting me that every time I'm alone, a switch comes on and I remember it over and over and over and over again. How that overcomes it. Bismillah wa billah wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi alillah wa la'nu da'imu ala a'da'im a'da'illah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'm Muhammad Ali Some of you might know me from Jum'ah night Some of you might have not watched it yet uh, It's basically a weekly theological discussion where we discuss different topics and today obviously we're going to be speaking about mental health uh, It's good that we've got a time limit on this lecture as some of you who might have watched Jum'ah nights you will know that I and talk for a long time so it's good that we've got a time limit today so today we're going to be speaking about mental health uh the first point i wanted to make and a huge disclaimer that i wanted to put out there is that this is a very nuanced and sensitive topic so um this is something that it doesn't even fall in the realm of religious experts let alone religious speakers like me so um, i'm going to be discussing just very briefly some of the principles surrounding how we should try and understand mental health from a Quranic and Hadithi perspective. So as we see from the narrations of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam, let's have a salawat for that. So Imam Ali says, Man katiba, uh, man maraduh, khana badanuh. He says that the one who doesn't look for a healing in the place that you're not meant to, he doesn't look for a healing in the place that you're meant to look for it, it's as if you've betrayed your body. So if you were to not go towards the right people in order to receive healing in any area, then it's as if you have betrayed your body. So this is where we see the importance of referring to specialists within the uh, realm of mental health in order to get advice and not people that are not special, uh, specialists in that topic. The second point I wanted to discuss was that existence is composed by the law of cause and effect and everything around the world it works on this principle, the principle of cause and effect, and it's the main principle behind the scientific method regarding observation in order to derive knowledge of this existence. One of the things that we see mentioned in the ahadith, so we have a narration from Mama Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, He says that Allah only conducts affairs through causes that he has already made, through which those things are able to happen. And we see in the narration that he explains that all of this knowledge is with the Imam of our time, with the Ahl al-Bayt salam. So we see that existence is composed of various causes that work dynamically with one another and can be clarified, understood, and this is what is known as knowledge, which is all with the Imam of our time. So we see this in the Quran that Allah says that the Quran and the religion is meant to act as an explanation for all things. Allah says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa nazzalna alayka al-kitab tabiyanan li kulli shay' wa hudan wa rahmatan wa bushra lil muslimin. He says we've revealed to you the book as an explanation of all things, a guide, a mercy and good news for those who fully submit. So we can see in the Quran here that it is claiming to be something that explains all parts of our religion, so it should be something that we refer to for all parts of our religion including mental health, including any kind of uh, issues that we may face in our lives. So we see that the Quran claims to provide clarity on every facet of existence on this level. And that would include that which is biological, physiological and psychological. So how does our physiology tie into our psychology as per the Quran and the Hadith? How does our diet affect our psychological state? What is the effects of our actions and life experiences such as trauma on our psychological well-being? All of these things are things that are explained and discussed within the Quran and the Ahadith. You just need to know where to look for them. So we see that ideally the Quran makes a statement and ideally we could derive all of this from the Quran and the Ahadith if we had the means to do so. And it might be sometimes a little bit uh, like dangerous to assume that we have all those tools. We know that ideally we can derive 
these understandings from the Quran and Hadith, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have the tools to do so. So that is why I I always say that in with regards to mental health and these kinds of things, it should be referred to as experts with a level of religious guidance as well. So essentially, if we were to have communities whereby there were com there were a, a, a council, for example, of mental health experts alongside religious experts in this domain, then we would have a bigger positive impact with regards to the help that people require. The third point is we want to look at how have the Imam spoken about psychological well-being? Is it merely an ailment of the soul, a lack of religiosity? You see a lot of people say that, why are you depressed? Why don't you just turn back to Allah? Why don't you just pray more? Why don't you just make dua, right? And to a lot of people, that is not helpful to them. They don't need to hear that when they are going through um, issues in their life or they're going through something as serious as depression. They don't need to be told that it is because of a lack of your relig religiosity. And that's why we see in the narrations of the Imams, the Imams actually explain that emotions are as a result of um, things that are biological. So we see a narration in Tibb al-Rida by Imam Rida alayhi salam where he says that the origin of sadness is in the spleen and the origin of happiness is in the omentum and kidneys. The omentum is basically a, a layer of tissue fat that basically covers uh, the organs that are in your abdominal area, but I'm sure the doctor will know more about that than I do. Um, so this gives an idea that you can see that the emotions uh, that are connected to an individual are something that is biological, is something that is connected to your, like for example, your hormones. It's not something that is beyond us. And it's something that we are able to interact with and basically work with, within the causes and the effects that we mentioned in our first point. And it is a function within the body and has a biological origin. And just like anything with a biological origin, it can be subject to sickness. And one such case is what's commonly known as trauma. We have a hadith, and this is a very interesting one, that sets a principle with regards to mental health and with regards to sadness that may be faced. We have a narration from Mama Sadiq <coughs> alayhi salatu wasalam, and it tells a story about Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. He, it says that he became extremely distressed when he couldn't find some water and this caused him like a crazy level of basically sadness and he turned towards Allah for guidance. Allah told him to go and find the black grapes in order to relieve his sickness or in, in order to relieve his sadness. And it says that very clearly in the hadith. What we see here is that there's a principle that mental health issues or sadness or depression on Islam doesn't tell you that it can be solved completely through spirituality, through making dua, through prayer. The principle that we see here is that Allah is telling him that you can use a material thing in order to help you with the problem that you are having. And that doesn't mean that anybody that has depression or illnesses should go and eat black grapes in today's time. This is just merely a principle to say that this was something that was available to Prophet Nuh at that time. And it's possible that, you know, there might be a chemical or something in grapes that was helpful to him at that time. So we see this as a principle in the ahadith as well, that the Imams didn't, Allah didn't tell Nuh to pray or to fast or to do anything spiritual in order to get rid of his sadness. So the suggesting of, 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 suggestion of remedying exclusively through prayers and fasting is not something necessarily that even comes from the religion. Point four is the various different supplications and teachings from the Imams that, that teach us that while there is a physical ailment also to these illnesses and things like that, there also has to be alongside it the supplication, the spirituality and the religiosity. And those two things work together in unison. So we see, for example, the example of Mama Sajjad alayhi salatu wasalam. He goes through severe sadness after the death of his father. And it is interesting that out of all the Imams, the du'as that we see from Imam Zain al-Abidin are special. We have Sahib Tasajadiyya. These are examples of Imam Zain al-Abidin sitting there and just crying his heart out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have examples of Imam Zain al-Abidin in one, in one kind of aspect. There is the aspect of spirituality. There is the aspect of religiosity that may be able to provide you help with regards to the illnesses or the distress that you may be facing. But we also have the narrations from the Imams that say that dua uh, without action is like having a bow without a bowstring, 
right? So what that means is that if you make du'a, you have to also do the thing in reality that helps your du'a come true. If you don't do that, then it's like having a bow without a bowstring. You're not even able to shoot an arrow with it. You wouldn't be able to reach your destination if you weren't able to couple your du'a alongside action. And obviously each of these have their methods and these supplications are something that I would recommend everybody and myself as well to look through and to take lessons from. And the last point that I want to make, point five, uh, and this is the final point. So um, we see that the Quran and Islam, generally speaking, advises that as a, as a prescription itself, Islam promises a good life and contentment to those who are able to work hard in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alongside the dua, alongside the action in order to help you relieve you of your spiritual or mental distress, these things are, uh, you're also required to ensure that you follow the religious path, have hope in Allah, have to work hard in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, man amala salihan man dhakarin wa untha wa huwa mu'minun falanahiyannahu hayatan tayyibah that whomsoever, male or female, does good deeds and has faith, we shall give them a good life. And Allah says in the Quran that That with the remembrance of Allah, the, the, the hearts, they find rest. And this is basically the Islamic prescription for life. And it's one that promises comfort of your heart and wellness of life, something all humans young or old basically wish for and something that we've all experienced at points in our life when you've been down there might have been something that have gone, gone gone wrong in your life and you sit down and on your prayer mat and you open your heart to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you do feel that comfort so that is basically sometimes it might sound like that is the most cliche and the most simple of explanations but sometimes that is what is required um for the people that are may, may be confused about where to go so that's basically where I wanted to end, inshallah. And I wanted to basically end on the promise of the Quran there in that it says that if we wish for wellness, we should go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alongside all of the things that he has asked us to do and the imams have asked us to do. And we will, inshallah, reach our destination and be able to help ourselves navigate all of the stresses of mental health that we will all inevitably go through at some point in our lives. Can I have a salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad? Allah. Okay, so I wanted to take the opportunity now to let Ahmed introduce the podcast and uh, yeah, we can basically open it to the rest of the panel and we can have a nice discussion. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, thank you so much uh, to SOAS Absoc and all the collaborating Absocs and to Absoc Mental Health for inviting after Maghrib um, to be here. It's an absolute honor to be here. SOAS obviously is a, an institution um, which a lot of us in our earlier days, our earlier academic days will have um, been involved with. Um, some of us were able to come to the SOAS ABSOC events and the London ABSOC events many years ago. So it's an absolute honor to be back here again. So thank you to the committee uh, and to ABSOC Mental Health and whoever was involved in, in the kind of facilitation of this event. Everyone okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. So we'll start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sayyid Ali. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing bro? Um, I'm well. Alhamdulillah. It's good Alhamdulillah. to be in a university setting. It's good to see, you know, young brothers, mu'mineen, mu'minat. Yeah. To attend such a, you know, topic. I'm, I'm surprised that people want to have a conversation on mental health. For me, for me, it's the first time. Really? First time having a discussion on mental health or trying to seek and better my knowledge about the mental health, the topic in its entirety. So for me, it's special. special. That's good. How are you? I'm okay. I, I, I really enjoyed um, your speech, Muhammad. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Alhamdulillah. I'm doing well. You know, that's something we don't do a lot on the podcast. We don't, we don't begin talking about how we are mentally a lot. Mm. Sometimes we do. Mm. Um, we ask each other how our weeks been and things like that, which I think is really important when we have when we have conversations on um, mental well being. Um, and sometimes we will give that cliche: hey, "I'm good, bro. How's life? How's family?" But sometimes Deep maybe down, in the same, yeah, yeah, you can yeah, share yeah. like I'm, I've had a bad day today or mm. whatever. But yeah, 
we've got a good topic obviously there's so many facets to this conversation so i'm looking forward to it inshallah um we want to introduce dr safraj jiraj uh who um inshallah is is going to enlighten us with with so many more facets of knowledge dr safraj how are you doing uh how would you respond if i said i'm not doing too good well i mean that's for you to tell us so. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm well, alhamdulillah. 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 Yeah. alhamdulillah. Where can we kind of kick off? Because obviously this is such a huge, huge conversation. We want to talk about mental well-being within the university environment or for a younger audience. If I'm really honest, I think there's, it's part of a wider conversation from our perspective. Um, and it falls into maybe our perception of how we talk about mental health. Is it just like a tick box exercise, which at times it feels like it is, to be honest? Or is it part of a wider conversation? Um, I think it's a very necessary conversation. I'm really grateful to the organizers for putting this on. I mean, I was surprised that you were saying, you know, you ain't been to one of these events before. I There's a part of me that thinks this is just overdone. People are tired of, of hearing really? about it. Um, uh, and, and we don't want to get to a point where we're fatigued talking about it, but mm. it's relevant to us each and every day. Um, our well-being is, is, is not something we can kind of divorce ourselves from. So... Um, <clears throat> when we the, in, when we talk about the language bit, I, I think that's just something I just wanted to start off by by noting because um, you know flyers and posters for these kind of events nine times out of ten, what image have they got? Like a brain. A brain. Yeah. yeah. So the assumption is mental health is all in the brain. Even just that term, mental health, is is just locating everything up here. Um, uh, and for me, as a psychologist. Uh, I'm not really feeling that because, uh, and particularly as a Muslim psychologist, I recognize well-being uh, being located in my body, in my soul, as well as my mind. Yeah. Um, but subtly, just locating it in the mind means it's just about a bunch of neurotransmitters. And if you take the right medication, boom, it's it's all good. And, and it's so much more complex than that. Mm-hmm. Would you Doctor, I've got a question. You know, alhamdulillah, you are a Muslim. And uh, <laughs> no, as Great a, start. I, as we, have, we, we have a Muslim expert on board, so th- this is amazing for us. And but the question I want to ask is like, when you have patients, I'm sure you have Muslim patients, mm-hmm. and you have non-Muslim patients. Is there a difference of how they see mental health? Great question, and uh, a resounding no. Mm. Um, you know, humans are human. They come in, um, you know, to my clinic. They're vulnerable. They're there because they just can't deal with it by themselves anymore. Um, now, the difference can come about on the strengths that I can draw on. Okay. Um, and, and, and that is something that we can't take for granted. Just because I'm Muslim doesn't mean I can access that strength. And just because I'm not a Muslim doesn't mean I can't access that strength. Like it or not, we're all mind, we're all body, we're spiritual. Mm. Uh, some of us can tap into that better than others. Mm. You know what's interesting as well? Um, I think you've both kind of alluded to the point and also in, in your speech uh, that mental health is not confined to the mind or, or your mentality alone. Obviously, there's there's repercussions that it has on your physical state, your emotional well-being and obviously your spirituality as well. And that it also can be something which is supported or affected by how, how you treat your physical being. Um, there could be ailments which are found um like physically like you said the spleen and the kidneys and and the other tissue thing which i'm not going to mention or begin to try and mention black grapes the what the black grapes black grapes (laughs) i think he i think he (laughs) meant the momentum yeah 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 yeah. but you know correct me if i'm wrong doctor and um obviously you guys as well but from what i've understood from islamic psychology islam kind of classifies mental health um in, for example, in Surah Yusuf said, Ali, you and I last week we, in kind of an unreleased thing which we didn't put out, we talked about Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Yes. You know, Surah Yusuf is amazing um, because the Holy Quran, and like you mentioned as well, Muhammad Ali, the Holy Quran is there not as a storybook, not as a book of a random kind of uh, different analogies just thrown in and jumbled up, but rather it's there for, for our use, right? Mm. Surah Yusuf is the only, verse, the only chapter in the Holy Quran where one story is confined within one chapter entirely. If we talk about Nabi Musa alayhi salam mm. or Salah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah Muhammad Allah Muhammad Allah Muhammad Allah Muhammad 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 or any Muhammad. of the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their, their stories are scattered. When we talk about Nabi Yusuf, in particular, we talk about Zulaikha. Mm. 
Mm. In in the story of Surah Yusuf, there's a part where when Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam is being offered the position in Egypt, he responds by saying, Before I take this job, I don't want like a black dot on my CV. Mm. So it will come back to haunt me. Go and speak to Zuleikha and clarify with her. So they did that. Did you pursue Yusuf or did he pursue you? And she says, Don't ask me about my Nafsul Amara Bisu. Because of course there's the three types of the nafs in Islam. Nafsul Amara, Nafsul Lawama, and Nafsul Mutmainna. The 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 accusatory soul, the uh, animalistic soul, and the tranquil soul. And of, obviously, if you look into it, we can get into this, and that's obviously another conversation. But would you think it's a fair assumption to say that Islam or Islamic psychology, like in perspective, looks a lot at the soul? But in Western society now, twenty first century, you could argue that Western mental health may have failed us to the point where it disregards the soul entirely. It's not seen as as a being or part of the being. I think it kind of goes both ways. I think that while mes- Western mental health like might have disregarded the soul completely, like there are a lot of Muslims that will try and disregard the mind completely, right? And the physical ailments that you might require. So I think it goes both ways in that sense. So there needs to be a balance that you find uh, in that discussion. I don't know whether the, the doctor has... Uh, I, I would totally agree. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'm not always comfortable with talking about Western psychology. I mean, like it's, it's not like a homogenous group, but... Um, you know, has, has Western psychology failed us by by neglecting the soul? I, I guess it, it has. It, you know, it doesn't account for that level of spirituality, but it does talk in terms of things like drives. And when we talk about the nafs and, and three, mm. you know, dimensions of the nafs, we're talking about drives. So there are similar concepts that are alluded to, but we've got different language. Um, uh, and I think you know, what you said about the neglect of, of the mind, if we just locate everything in the soul, we're neglecting the other p- relevant parts of our being. I think that's interesting because the Quran also does mention with regards to people and each nafs having a sa'iq, something that drives it. So I think the language there also is, is very interesting in that you've brought in, you know, drive and it's, it's, it's something that you could actually even like, you know, find in the Quran as well. So that is very interesting. You know, at the very beginning, I mentioned this is my first time, uh, you know, being in an environment surrounding mental health. And the reason why I feel it's that way is because Muslims, we tend to shy away from this topic. I think there's like a, like a stigma or a taboo on the whole concept of mental health that if you suffer from any mental illnesses, or you have an issue with the, your state of mind or your mental well being, is that somehow you are either spiritually weak. Or you don't have iman, belief, taqwa on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we try not to address it because we don't want to be seen as someone Judge. who is far yeah. away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you think people do that? Like, 100%, 100%. 100%. I think also culturally, some of the backgrounds that we come from, uh, and obviously with mental health becoming such a big thing with time as well, like a lot of maybe there may be elders in some of our communities that, you know, for, for them, it's just like, get over it kind of thing. You know, I mean, we had to go through so much hardship. Kind of thing so you know there there is there's that aspect as well i think there may be people that don't feel comfortable necessarily uh or don't feel like they'll be understood in some communities and you know i think that definitely plays a big part in it as well as the you know judgment from from other people like i know a brother yeah. sorry sorry know how many you want to say something like i know a brother many years ago he was like very depressed he was going through like severe depression i know there's like different levels doctor clinically there's like uh moderate uh, severe, this guy was having real serious se- severe depression. Every time he'd go to like a Maulana or an Islamic scholar, uh, he was like advised, you know, you need to believe in Allah more, you need to rely on Allah more. We're not saying that's not the right approach, mm. but I know definitely when, if you have been diagnosed professionally to suffer from mental health, Islam spiritually and seeking professional help must go hand in hand. Yeah. That's why I asked you very, very early on, I was like, do Muslims see it different as non Muslims? That was the point I was trying to get to. Their mindset, do they feel like they lack belief or iman or taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Mm. You face that. I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting point about like how we block it out early. Yes. Um, uh, people from minoritized ethnic backgrounds, uh, and that includes people from, you know, who subscribe more to like religious perspectives, mm. they're underrepresented in primary care. So that's the, the early stages of treatment, okay. but they're overrepresented in like tertiary care. 
mm. where you end up getting like sectioned and it's okay. it's much more severe so like part part of that is understanding that it's you know the system there's structural racism but part of that is you know we leave it too late we leave it too yeah. late and and then it gets so bad boom it explodes so there is definitely something to be said about how we judge this and you know i, I love how you you start making reference to the quran and, and you know when we look at uh the stories of bibi maryam you know how is she feeling under that tree yeah 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 you know, when when we've got that year of sorrow like what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know lacks faith he, he was at the peak of his faith yeah yeah Imam Sata. so you know there's countless examples and i guess there's something about us coming to terms with you know what it's okay to be feeling bad mm. you know that's part of yeah. it. we don't have to pathologize it and you know a, a part, an extension is going off at a bit of a tangent mm. that you know you can swing too far the other way so you know part of me being here is trying to get across the message that we don't need to pathologize everything but at the same time, we don't need to be just ignoring it and pretending like it's not there because, you know, those those at the highest stations experience distress because it's part yeah. of our being. Can I just add on that pathologization point <clears throat> to trivialize um, or to depathologize pathologize mental health issues to a degree? I think obviously there's it's it's rude like it lacks akhlaq so if someone comes to you and they say yeah, i'm struggling and you kind of dismiss it mm. or it makes them feel degraded or it makes them feel like this guy's not taking me seriously how would you like it if i did that to you or when you come to me i'm not going to give you the time of day but in the same way like you said doctor there's there's uh, like an approach in the holy quran which or even in the hadith where we talk about the the lives of the ayyama alayhim salam we talk about the anbiya you know go back to surah yusuf that story is just crazy because you've got so many instances of real struggle. You're talking about um, Nabi Yusuf being ostracized by his brothers, thrown in the well, his father being told that he's been killed and seeing a, a shirt with blood on it. Mm. Obviously, then later on, the solitary confinement. What's the, the, the one thing which human rights organizations have an issue with is solitary confinement. Why? Because as a human being, you need social interaction. You need to interact with people to be able to live a, san a life of sanity, right? And then obviously later on being in, in prison, but knowing he's innocent at the same time, being accused of something that he's done wrong. Now, interestingly, when Nabi Yaqub, alayhi salam, his father in the Holy Quran, he despairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tells Allah his anguish. He doesn't despair of Allah's mercy. But he despairs to Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him, he says, um, I'm paraphrasing the, the ayah, but he's saying to him, um, if if Yusuf and Binyamin were dead, I would bring them back to life. Don't worry. Go out and feed the poor. I think Subhanallah. Like there's that's that's a really interesting instruction which Allah has given His Nabi, right? You think maybe there's one of two reasons why He's done that. Maybe number one, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling the Holy Prophet, go out and keep yourself occupied. Do something. Hit those dopamine levels. Go out and help people in need. But secondly, more so, remember that there are those people who are less well off than you. You know what someone says? Sometimes you've said to me, say, I don't know if it's been on the pod or not, but you've been like, how are you doing? And I'll say, I'll say better than, worse than some, better than most. Mm. Worse than some, better than most. Because there's an acknowledgement or a realization or an admittance that I'm still better off than people. Do you know what I mean? So I think to trivialize people or to depathologize kind of people's matters is can be offensive but at the same time there's there has to be a resilience and then sorry i just want to make a last point we asked people on 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 the uh instagram follow us guys if you're not ready we asked people um is join it the channel as well yeah and join the channel yeah we've got uh, a good following we put some behind the scenes stuff is it impossible is it impossible to always be strong and resilient this is this is a really split opinion can i ask the audience this is it impossible so hands up if yes, it's impossible to always be strong and resilient. Hands down if you think no. Probably about 50-50, isn't it? MashaAllah. So similarly, 56% of people said nothing is impossible with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And 44% of people said yes, it's not human to always be strong and resilient. Doctor, I know when we were WhatsApping before, you told me about resilience. Mm. Is that something you want to discuss? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what we even understand by resilience. Now, 
coming at it from a, a faith-based perspective, when we greet each other, what do we say? Salam So we're not bidding each other happiness, we're bidding each other peace. peace. Now, for me, resilience is about your ability to deal with challenges. But dealing with challenges doesn't mean that you permanently have to have a smile plastered on your face. You could be crying, but you could be at peace. Mm. And you could be smiling, but you could be not experiencing any tranquility inside. So I think this, there is, I, I would agree that, you know, we can be um, resilient all the time, but our understanding of resilience needs to be reevaluated. And that needs to allow for us to experience these God-given emotions. Like, you know, with, with the perfect creation, we were created to experience anxiety and depression and guilt and shame and, and, and those range of emotions for a reason. They all serve a function. I think that's really interesting as well, actually, because when, when we say as well, we're taking examples from holy personalities, from people like, um, say, the Maryam, or we're taking examples from people like Imam Sajjad. These people are at the peak of their faith. If Imam Sajjad is crying for Imam Hussain all the time, if, if, if the Imam of our time is crying day and night, they can't be described to not be content. They cannot be described to not be at the peak of their faith and infallibility. And I think that's an important distinction to make that, you know, you might be crying, but you might still feel peace and contentment in your heart. And that's a, there, there is a, there's a level of separation and distinction to make there as well. So that's very interesting to me. So this is nice to hear and it reminds me of a point in uh, by Lady Zainab You know, here, here we're talking about, you know, her, go, uh, her going through like immense grief, seeing her loved ones one by one, butchered, killed, uh, you know, taken away from her. And not just anyone, this is Imam Hussein, her brother, her actual Imam. Yet she saw nothing but beauty. That means she, was, she, 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 she knew full well that emotion does exist. For her to even say that statement because she said it from emotion but yet she put allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that mind for her to say that statement i see nothing but beauty that's not something simple to say mm. because the ahlul bayt salam, they know better than us and it's, i think it's a lesson to us that no matter what calamity there is either someone is having a worse calamity than us or you need to find allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during those oh, highs and lows throughout your life and i think that's very important like i mean in islam Everyone can face anxiety as Muslims. Everyone can face a level of depression. Everyone can face, you know, a level of losing hope, feeling sad, or you've lost a loved one. There is like a grief. Emotions are there by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How we control them and what we make of them and the outcome that leads to them, I think connects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us in great detail because it can't be alone. Because I, I believe as a Muslim, if you suffer from mental health, this is the opinion, there's no factual doctor, you can correct me. Mental ill health. Mental ill health, uh, forgive me there, is that you can't do it alone. Yes, you can seek professional help, but to help and guide you and stay you with that professional help, you need that reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Am I right? Yeah, you call me out, the therapist is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean we're, like you, need like, that godly like you said, we're social beings. Yeah. Um, and, and the role that each of us play, particularly in a community, cannot be understated. Um, 100%. Yeah, any emotion you think about any emotion you've ever ever experienced how much of the emotions you experience are in relation to someone else mm. yeah now, someone else making you happy someone else making you sad when you're sitting on your ones you might experience some variation neutral. in your Generally. emotion but it, yeah. it's being around people have you know. heard of this thing called sajud.co oh. this is a website i think you guys should check it out when you get time it's called sajud.co s-u-j-o-o-d.co Okay. It's it's wicked. It's a it's a really nice website that I haven't been on it in a while. But from what I remember, it, it's like a list of emotions, and you pick the emotion you're feeling. It will give you a du'a or the verse of the Holy Quran to recite specific to that emotion. It's like such a wide range. I've done it a lot. I've used it a lot. It's really good. I can see a bunch of people check it out now. Check it out. It's really useful. I want you at some point, doctor, to let us know if you've checked it out and your feedback on it because it would be really cool to know. Um, kind of moving on in the conversation now. MashaAllah, a lot of students here, um, the, the challenges that a younger generation face today, one may argue, is different to the challenges in previous generations. Um, specifically those of youth now, you're worrying about academics, maybe social life, 
you have your parents telling you you need to get married or you're engaged and you've got pressure from that forthcoming marriage or you've got siblings bugging you, you need to make money. Some people may have lost family members. At the same times as well, there's uh, like the pressure within uni. You know, you've got coursework and exams and whatnot. Can I ask from your experience, have you ever dealt with cases of, of students specifically? What sort of cases have you come across and yeah, advice that you'd have? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, like all those factors you laid out, I've got to be honest, there wasn't a single one of them that our previous generation hasn't faced. That's true. Um, yeah. But I mean, it'd be interesting, you know, later on when, when people share their perspectives, like what is different about what this generation faces compared to previous generations? Um, in terms of my clinical work, um, always consistently, there's always a high proportion of students especially uni students. I mean, I, I don't work in a child and adolescent service, um, but you know, we, my service takes anyone from 17 age, uh, age 17 and up. And there's always, you know, an over-representation because this is one of the more stressful parts of, a, some, of someone's life. You know, the transition you're making from childhood to adulthood um, is stressful enough as it is. And then, like you said, there's all those other pressures to, to deal with. Um, do do people in this generation kind of seek out help more than previous generations? Yeah. I mean, the rates uh, are on the rise. Now, part of that, I believe, is because people are just more aware. Mm. Awareness isn't always a good thing, though, because if it's an awareness that's pathologized, then the moment something goes wrong, you're like, oh, I need to get some help. I can't deal with this. Yep. Yeah. Um, if it's not pathologized, then you can make a, a more reasonable call about this and that. Is this the point at which to get help? Yeah, because if I don't stretch myself enough, I never get to find out what my level of resilience is. And there can be uh, among some people um, a, a sense of, you know, I just can't get out, outside of my comfort zone. And, and you know, I, I think we were designed, you know, to engage in a life that gave us tests and tribulations. Sounds um, because there's because our growth often lies within that. At the same time, if you take too hardcore an approach of just don't get help, um, you know, just man up, man up, do it myself. Well, then you're neglecting those blessings around you. And I think you know, particularly for Muslims, I get this so much where people say, you know what, can you see my son, please? Or you know what, can you see my wife, please? Can you? See? And you're like, okay. Uh, do you want to put them on the phone? No, no, no. They they won't do it. Can can and it doesn't work. Like they have to be ready to to seek out themselves, that help themselves. Um, but the often a block is you know I'm making du'a, and it's not getting fixed. But sometimes we need to consider what if the answer to our du'a has been placed over there, in him or her. Sad. And, and, and we need a, a wider appreciation of where our blessings lie. See those those smiles. Yeah, yeah. So you know I'm smiling, don't you? Tell us. No, you tell us. Sure, 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 sure. No, this is something we talk about a lot about du'a specifically. Why is why is our du'a not being answered? And I know it's slightly on a tangent, but I think it does play a role because, like you said, doctor, there's so many different things people are going through at this age, and. I'm, I'm curious to know as well, maybe we'll come back to it at some point, but whether it's exacerbated by social media and screen time and whatnot. Well, um, you, you tell me, out of all the things you mentioned, yeah, pressure of academia, family, this, that, and the other, you didn't mention social media. No, but I, yeah. feel, I feel the presence of social media exacerbates other issues. That, that, for me, is the single biggest difference between what this generation has to deal with and, mm. and previous generation. Mm. Like the overuses of screen time, becoming lazy, and then lashing out and, and whatnot, M maybe a number of different things. Well, I mean, what you see on social media, isn't it? Because I think if you're like, for example, I use Twitter a lot um, and you'll come across loads of people on a daily basis scrolling that will say things about being in a bad mental health state. Yeah. Um, and some of those tweets go viral. You'll see those like on a regular basis. So that even does contribute to your psychology with regards to how you view mental health uh, some of them even like it, it's, it's weird to say but it's like um i don't know what the word is but like almost like boasting about their or or, or portraying it their their trauma in a happy way kind of thing and it's it's really strange because it's it's quite a cognitive dissonance and like yeah. I, I don't understand is this person upset or 
or not. So, you know, there's a lot of that on, on social media. Can you give it one example? I know what you mean. By the way, people do you know what like I mean? the tone, the, the, the yeah, tone the, 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 the tone in which it's done is like as if yeah. it's a meme or is it this is a joke? Like it's indirect. Yeah, as if it's a joke. Like I, I don't know if, if anybody here knows what I'm I'm talking about. But yeah, yeah, I'm getting nods in the audience. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a bit of a badge of honor. It's like, you know what? You know, you know I got traumatized, you know? Yeah. And it's like that. Do you somehow... come across people like that? Who 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 wear it like a badge of honor or not, not, not in my clinical work, really. Really, yeah. um, I mean, d day to day, you, you, you get people like that. Um, uh, but I mean, just, just coming back to, um, you know, the, the, the impact that social media has. Uh, someone shared an analogy with me. They said, like, you know, like uncle, and I still can't go over the offense when people call me uncle. But anyway, <laughs> um, and it's like uncle. See, in your generation, it was like you know, you were connected with like you know, a limited part of the world. Like we're now in the ocean. And I'm like, you know what? That's that's really helpful for me to think about it that way because the in my little swimming pool, you know, I, I could just swim around, I could see what was happening and there was nothing really pulling me one way or another. When you're in an ocean now, it can be a bit overwhelming and you have got so many currents that you could just not account for. Currents pulling you this way, currents pulling you that way. So that that can really exacerbate kind of the good stuff but really exacerbate the bad stuff and create more vulnerabilities. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, we got a question on Instagram that I would like to share. Um, someone says, I struggle being alone as I'm an international student. How can I overcome this? And this is a student in London. So this is a question to you, doctor. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a beautiful question. And uh, you know, I thank the person that's kind of been brave enough to kind of share that. Um, I, I would kind of look to each one of us here to think about how how we can support that person because you know we all we all have friends and people that we know and you know the ones that like smile biggest are the ones that we get drawn to and we want to be with the ones that then go missing and drop out it's it's easy to stop noticing that they're there and you know as a muslim if there's if there's one part of the body that's hurting uh, we, we 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 all, all feel that. the pain. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, so you know, there's there's a there's a couple of do's and don'ts that I did want to share at some point. And um, some of the the do's are just love that person around you, not because they're you know interesting or good looking or whatever it is, but because they're 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 a beloved creation of Allah first and foremost. Um, and as part of that, um, just be there. If you love someone, even when you don't really like or want to be around them, you give them your time. And giving them your time in a way that it might be boring for you, but you can make it interesting. And, and you know, just coming back onto this bio, psycho, socio, spiritual approach, like you don't just have to be there and just listen all the time. That's a, that's a key part. That's how it's got to start. It's got to start by a lot of listening, a lot of validation of how they're feeling, even if you don't agree with them. Yeah. You know, the easiest thing can, to do can be like, of course they didn't mean it that way when they said that. Mm -hmm. But that's that's not what that person needs to hear in that moment. Yeah. Well, you can get to that point, but first you, they got to feel like they're they're alongside you. Um, so the listening and that. But then you know what? Should we should we go for a walk? Should we do something physical? Let's do something with our bodies. What is it we're eating? Let's go and eat something good. Uh, that that's not like a big greasy fried burger. Um, but you know, some something that you can think, okay, you know what, this is this is gonna be helpful not just for my body but for my soul. And then start building up that that social kind of element. And you know, for the person who's kind of just reached out, um, yeah, I would say just take your time, be gentle with yourself, remember that you're loved, and you know, get down to one of these programs. Yeah. Um, you know, get down to your community center. Um, and then then we here then take responsibility. That's, that's, that's I, like, I like that and, and it reminds me of uh, I read something early on on the train on my way here trying to understand this whole topic of you know uh, our mental well-being and you mentioned a point of eating and there was a point where s someone said in the article that if you eat the right food you'll have the right state of mind if you do the correct exercises that trains the mind to understand positives and the negative negativity that you're in so definitely there is like a correlation 
to our mental well-being by the food we eat, by the exercise we do, and the interactions that we have. Now, yeah. this brother or sister that asks this question, they're feeling alone. Now, and I don't think it's their fault. I think it's the fault of us. We're the ones not checking in on people. Like, I have friends that maybe I should check in on more to see how they're doing. All I know is how they're doing online. Like, I, I, I haven't been gone to visit them. I haven't picked up the phone, made a phone call. How are you doing? How's family? Is everything okay? You know, do you need to hang out? Because sometimes we see them, you know, they'll post online. I want to talk about social media. Everyone's on social media. We just see the, the goods and the highs of everyone. Mm. Everyone highs the lows and, and the struggles that they go through. And they do it alone. And they do it alone. And I, and I think if we can take an approach and improve ourselves and looking out for each other, that will go a long way as a community. I think that's a big thing for Absox as well. Because if you like, say you're an international student, and you come and you come to London, you come to mm. SOAS, for example, you've got loads of shit around you. But say you go up north, yeah, you go to, I don't know, Loughborough. I went to Loughborough, right? It's lonely. Yeah. yeah. Bro, like you're, you're struggling to find Muslims, you know. Like really, I, walked, yeah. I walked for three hours in, in my uh, accommodation like area. I, couldn't, I didn't see a single coloured person. No. <laughs> for three hours, bro. Jesus Christ. I saw white people for three hours. Oh my god. And I was I was literally I was in shock. I was like, where have I come? They were all full of no. That's because yeah, we're from the ends, bro. When <laughs> we used to two if Sam's two for two, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, but, I get that. Alhamdulillah though, obviously after a while, obviously you'll find your people, but yeah, yeah it can get lonely. Like if you're an international student, whatever. That's why it's important these collabs that we have with Absox. You see, we're like Midlands Absox, you know, all of Everybody come to this place. We're gonna have a, and you know, it's, it's good. It's, it's so good for important. networking. And you know, I remember on my, I, I went to Aston. Yeah, shout out. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> shout out Aston. Yeah, so yeah, bro, yeah, shout <laughs> out Aston. Big up. But no, like Alhamdulillah, man. The the like you said, the Midlands Absox, amazing in terms of population, mm -hmm. amazing. And a lot of the boys who I went like who I went to school with in the UK or even mm. in London, I mean, or even from the community, from, from my local community were at the same university as me. Alhamdulillah, I was so lucky that the day I moved into uni, I met like five or six brothers from Absoc. And it was very interesting because at the time I was not in a good place, like socially, in the sense that I was with the wrong crowds, I had bad habits. Um, like when I went to Freshers' Weeks, uh like all you know events and whatnot i was i had what i was when i entered uni was very different to three months into uni and that was because i was hanging around initially with people who i went to school with who are not muslim and then the absoc pulled me in mm. and within a couple of months i was like in the thick of it absocs play a huge responsibility 100 percent, 100 percent. and it's not just the absocs it's our mosque mm -hmm. youth groups it's our whatsapp groups it's Sometimes within social circles, you guys will realize this, whether you like it or not, or whether you like to admit it or not, there are people who are kind of like leaders within social groups or organizers or whatever you want to call it. Mm. Be that person if there's no one there already, but initiate a gathering. You know, I was speaking to some of my friends um, a month or two ago. I'm at that age where a lot of my close friends are either recently married or have recently become parents and who are struggling, like 100%. So struggling financially, having to be the man of the house, the father of the house, putting food on the table, making your wife feel happy, spoiling her, looking after your kids. So you go from being a bachelor three years later, you've got kids and you've got like work. And so I have a lot of friends who like collectively felt this way. All right. We, we inshallah, next week is the first of our monthly, I don't want to call it like a dad's meeting because that sounds a bit weird. But like um, <laughs> we're doing, we call it monthly discussion. So eight or nine guys, close circle of friends where every month someone different will host and we, we're going to formalize it like schedule my sister said to me on the way here she's like let's schedule a time to talk i was like well that's a bit weird isn't it but like sometimes you that's have important. to do that like you have to schedule time for people or yeah. and, and make it be selfish about it so like, i i need i'm not getting time to enjoy life or to speak to people or to like be part be remember who i was a few years ago when life was easy i was in gcse's or you know, I didn't have that pressure I have now and I'm in second, third year uni and I've got deadlines of coursework and I'm applying for grad jobs and this and that. It's heavy. It's really, it can be really, really overwhelming. But take a step back, take a breather. And I just, from a last point from me, I just want to make a shout out to all of you guys because you're, I know you're working hard. Uni is tough and you're now in January. So you're approaching exam season, I'm sure. You've got deadlines. Some of you have got like midterm courseworks and whatnot. But the main thing is, is that don't feel 
pressured. If you don't get a 2-1 or you don't get a first, it's not the end of the world. If you don't get the job, grad job you're applying for, it's not the end of the world. Because big picture, I guarantee you, when you're like 27, 28, you're like four or five years into your work, you will feel like, yeah, it worked out. Maybe I took a different route. Maybe I went a different way. When I was 21, I wanted to go into a different industry completely to what I'm in now. Completely. And I, I like, I had a, a graduate route and I went all the way to the end. I got down to a last two stage interview, like two people, and I, I didn't get the job. I remember feeling like my life was falling apart and I was so upset. And a few years on now, alhamdulillah, I look back on it. I changed industry and I'm so glad because if I had taken that route, I would have been a different person. But it's, it's a big picture analysis. It's a mature way of thinking that we have to get to where we think we have to support people because we don't know what they're going through. We have to be the person to pull people in. And if you're one of those people who needs to be pulled in, don't be hard on yourself. Like you said, I think that's a really good point. Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, the, the big picture thing, I think, is something you don't have to be a psychologist to be able to do. And I think one of the great frames we have, again, as Muslims, is that capacity to say, hang on, there's a big, bigger picture in terms of dunya and akhira. And how much is the, the impact of what's happening today in this hour? How's that fitting with the bigger picture? You know, how much is that going to matter to me in a week, a year? And actually, what's the consequence on my akhirah? And if, I think if you could be more in tune with that, it helps you in the decision-making pro process and allows you to live with more, more of the salam rather than just chasing the happiness. Ahsan, ahsan. Can, I, can I take a diversion, Said? so if you don't mind? Yeah, I want to ask you a question, slightly on a tangent, because you know you mentioned uh, on a podcast we did, I can't remember which one it was, in the last few weeks, um, about the situation in Palestine specifically, um, all our hearts are with Palestine and now our minds are with Palestine. So we're consciously making decisions. Uh, my cousin bought us this coffee on the way here. And I said, as long as it's not Starbucks, I'm good. I just don't buy it because our decision-making process has now been fine-tuned towards solidarity for Palestinians. But you mentioned, said on a podcast a few weeks ago, how we're at a stage now where we can't sleep at night without thinking about it or we have tears rolling down our face when you see the situation that people are living in and the trauma um, in the long term that people have not just in the short term um, I want to ask you about this because you made that point I want to know exactly what you meant and how it's affected you mentally as well yeah if we're, if we're going back to our don't talk about Palestine episode is this what well, you're referring to one, yeah. I encourage you all to watch that episode if you haven't um, I, I remember the day we recorded that podcast, we spoke to each other. Uh, I remember we were being shown videos of tens and tens of children. That was with the, the Baptist hospitals, like yes. two hours before we yes. recorded. Yeah. So that really hit me. And I, I remember it was like 9, 9.30 p.m. UK times when I came across that news and I opened up social media. Everyone's talking about it and everyone's sending it. Straight away, I, I felt like I'm shaking. And if I can be very honest, I, I've never felt vulnerable for no reason. Like I, I, I felt like I'm losing my own self seeing the tragedies fall live stream. It was like streamed live to me. So that really hurt me deep down and it brought out some emotions I haven't experienced in a very long time, which is like grief. Um, sometimes people can channel that and become angry. But I think it's important to understand, I mentioned earlier during this conversation here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us emotions that we can use to channel and you know allow our well mental well-being to be in a safe safe space and if we're, if we're seeing uh, images and videos of atrocities taking place in the middle east for example as many of us have seen it's important not to become angry and not just you know feel sad or nothing use that to channel yourself to better your mental state your mental well-being and you say you know what if they're going through this how can I help them? It could be dua, it could be making a prayer, it could be speaking out on their behalf. And, and you know, here we are now mentioning uh, the, 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 the Palestinians. This is one way of us raising awareness for them and allowing us to digest what is going on in the world. Because it's not easy to bottle up. Like I, I have daily conversations with my wife at home about Palestine. It's like every night before we go to sleep, we have to discuss it. Mm -hmm. We let yeah. Allah, others, I don't know what to do. I'll be honest, yani if we're being bombarded constantly throughout the day, seeing videos and images of what's happening around the world, I don't know what to do. But it reminded me of a time, and I think I'll mention a point here. 
where I went through grief, okay? Um, when I was 15 years old, I lost my father. And when, when I lost my father, I felt like I lost a part of me. Genuinely, I lost a part of me. So I, I don't know if, I, if I'm, if I'm going to say I, I was suffering mentally, but I, I, I know there was grief inside me. And it lasted for a very, very long time that I wouldn't want to go to school. Even if I, want to, if, I, if I ended up going to school, I'd end up saying, hey, can I go home, please? I don't want to be here. Then I go home. I don't want to be home. I want to go out. Then I go out and I come back home. It was like, I don't know where I was. And one thing that really helped me was that a couple of months in, after I lost my father, one of my teachers was like, uh, Ali, maybe you want to speak with someone about it. It was, re it was really affecting me. And I was like, I don't mind. I'll give it a go. And it really helped. So the school, alhamdulillah, you know, they, they facilitated a time and a space where they bring a counselor to school so that I can speak with them. And that really helped me understand that why was I keeping my emotions inside? Because I, I, I wouldn't cry in front of my mom. I wouldn't tell my sister or my brother how I feel. Why would I keep it inside? And that really affected me, affected my day-to-day -day thinking, my studies, you know, everything that we were, we were doing in day-to-day -day life. And then I realized the more I spoke to someone who can understand what I'm going through and give me the right advice, that helped me calm down. It brought me back to where I need to be mentally. Mentally. So I know my heart was in the right place. I know my thoughts were in the right place, but my mental state was all over the place. So sometimes it's just a conversation. Like Palestine, I'm having a conversation with my wife every day. That helps us process what we're seeing. When I lost my father, finally having a conversation with someone about it, I finally understood I'm not the only one going through this. Everyone loses their family at some yeah. stage in their life. Yeah. So for me, I would say no, never, never, ever bottle it, bottle it in. And always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never burden you with something that your soul can't bear. Ahsan. He tells us this in the Holy Quran, and this is something that we truly believe in. Yeah. So inshallah, let's remember that. Santum. Guys, if I can ask everyone to join me in reciting Surah Fatiha for Sayyid Abbas, Radha, we said Ali's father. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Malik, Yom. Bismillah ar-Rahman I think there's so many points to mention. Firstly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on your soul. And you live, he lives vicariously through you, Said. So his, you, you, you continue his legacy. He did incredible work. And for those who don't know, Said Ali's father passed away in Yawm al-Ashur while he was giving lectures in Bahrain. And he was a servant. Kuwait. Khadim. Sorry, in Kuwait, Kuwait, yeah. He was a servant of Imam Hussein al -Islam. And now you could, I'm sure you guys know what Said Ali does, not just out, not within the podcast, but also outside. He's the servant of Imam Hussein al-Islam, and he's learned that from through his parents. May Allah bless them both. We try. Habib, um, thank you. I, we've got more points we want to talk about, but yes. I'm conscious we started late and we, we kind of want to move into the Q&A section. Um, Doctor, anything to like wrap up before we open the questions up to yeah, the audience? I, I just, just wanted to thank Sayyid again for sharing that and just, just picking up on that point as, as a, a, a parting message about processing. Um, you know, throughout human history, throughout cultures, uh, when someone dies, mm. uh, what's common uh, as a theme is that people have funerals. Yeah, yeah, that you know where they bury the body, body or burn the body, or whatever it is. Um, at, funeral is a social event. Now, the person who's bereaved, whether they like it or not, when you when people come to the funeral, they're going to talk to you. They're going to talk to you about your loved one. Yeah, those people who who <laughs> refuse to engage with the funeral, who don't talk about it, who bottle it up, you'll see six months, a year, two years. They're, they're still suffering. But there's something about that process that's n that naturally facilitates a, an opportunity to start talking yeah. about it. Yeah. And, and processing it is so important um, uh, and, and you know, leads on to this closing point I wanted to make about, well, who do you process with? Mm. You know, do you have to look for a therapist? Do you have to look for a counsellor? <coughs> you know, should, what, what is it? Doesn't, doesn't Islam just say, you know what, don't talk about nothing, just talk about it with God? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be that first point, you know, there's, there's something about our nervous system that says when you don't belong, you're in danger. Yeah? And, and we always belong to our creator. So that's, that's a, a really nice thing to hold on to. But we often need something that complements that in the form of his creation. Mm -hmm. So I would say that absolutely we should be talking to other people that we trust. 
there, there is a there is a point around oversharing and we need to you know islam is all about balance yeah yeah you know but well-being is all about balance emotion is all about balance we should be getting angry just not too angry we should be channeling in the right way we shouldn't become desensitized by overexposure we need to get the balance right but ultimately just being there for each other and you know i think this is the theme that's come through today is you know anyone watching this just take that responsibility yeah, of being there for each other you know, just look through your contacts who who hasn't given me a thumbs up for a while let me chase them up um and, and you know bring that brotherhood that sisterhood together that the one thing i have you know in my experience with absox you know i love them but the one thing that jars me is that when you go to a prayer room all my Sunday brethren they're all like and people are moving around yeah they're all getting into my see our brothers do like no, no, you pray over there you do your own thing it's all about for other yeah. and actually <laughs> you know what you know this this is our this is something incumbent on our faith do it together do jamaat yeah. is is so highly regarded we don't follow that regard and that's, that's a stepping stepping stone to being more together to belong it reminds you of brotherhood and it's something islam emphasizes yeah Sense. Okay, guys, um, we'll leave it there for our soul conversation for the time being. However, we want to open it up to the audience, so please raise your hand, feel free. If you want to ask a question, but you don't want to ask it publicly, that's okay. Obviously, it would be nice if people can ask public questions. But if you want to ask us a private question, you can DM us now on After Magra Podcast on Instagram. If you diamonds to use someone else's phone, but point being is you can ask us a question and um, the team behind the scenes will let us know if someone has asked a question. All right, has anyone got a question that they'd like to begin with? We have a couple of roaming mics. Bismillah. Um, I believe someone talked about have, like struggling with friendships during the beginning of uni with non-Muslim friends, and I think that's an issue that almost all of us have. How do we navigate these really, like these friendships that we have with people who are not Muslim? Because when you become friends with someone, you you have like a sense of responsibility. You know, I'm close to this person. I have like a sense of influence over this person. Should I or should I not get involved and try to I'm not saying convert them or um, you know try and just help them a little bit? Say them like I see what you're doing. I don't think it's good. Or is that even the right approach? Should we just stay out of it? What would you say? Nah, I'm you, I'm I'm a a <laughs> you went to Loughborough, you have to walk three hours to find someone. Yeah, nah. I mean, I think the thing is with, um, I think it's a, it's a bit of a difficult one. I think if the person themselves is interested in wanting to understand your values and your morals, like, so for example, myself at uh, Loughborough, um, I was actually lucky enough to have um, certain people that, ended up joining the hall that weren't um that that were Muslim. So um yeah you like I had became Shia basically. Nah, I mean I wasn't I wasn't out there to convert anybody. But I think the thing is with like for example the people that are non Muslims, um I think you can you can maintain your boundaries and I think if if the if the way that you maintain your boundaries is in a respectful way, I think if the people that are interested want to know more about your religion, want to know more about your values, then by all means, you know, you should try and speak to them about what you know. But I think if you like, you know, go in trying to convert people, that's a little bit of a, it's a bit of a weird one. And it can be like, it can take, it can take people in the opposite direction than what you want. Um, in terms of having friends, obviously you should have friends of, of all faiths, isn't it? We, we're not a religion that says, you know, don't speak to anybody that's not Muslim. Um, of course, you should try your best. I, I think this is my personal experience speaking because I tried to surround myself as much as I could at university with Muslims. And the primary reason why I did that because I moved out. I wasn't living in, in Harrow anymore, right? So now I haven't got my family base around me. I haven't got my community around me. And if I've moved out now, I have to make sure that I've got Muslims around me so that it's prayer time at Dhuhr. Maybe I'm revising hard in the library you know, my Muslim friends are going to be like, yo, it's Dora time, come, let's pray. Or, you know, if if you've got nothing to do at, at night time, this is what happened to me on my first night. I, I moved into Loughborough. I'm seeing everybody's gone to the club. I'm on my ones at home, on my ones. Literally nobody was left other in than dorm, myself yeah? in my whole dorm. I had the same experience. So yeah. yeah, literally. <laughs> 24 men, 23 have gone to the club. Yeah, yeah. You get me? It was just you <laughs> yeah. and the gins. Yeah, just, just me there. And I'm thinking, well, you know what I mean? So it gives you something to do. 
So it's really important to have that Muslim group of friends, but also like, you know, you just have to like be normal and natural in it. Like you don't have to be weird about it. You get me? Like mm. if there's, there's people that are non-Muslims and stuff, like, you know, there's nothing to be weird about. They're just, they're just there. You get me? You, you make your friends, you chat about football, you chat about normal stuff. And if they're interested in the religion, you give them your bit that you can. And yeah, just keep it natural, man. There's nothing to, to deep too much, in my opinion. 100%. So, um, I'm going to speed through it because we've got loads that have requested. That was a bit of a in. long one, sorry. No, no, no it's cool. We've, um, doctor, I think this is a good one for you. Uh, well, there's a few that you probably could answer. So I want to come. I have a question. If you see someone close to you struggling with depression and they're drifting from their faith as a, as a result of it, what's the best way to support them? Uh, first thing you don't do is tell them that they're drifting from their faith um, because I think that, like you said, sometimes you just get the opposite reaction. People, people don't want to hear that. That can make them feel worse, and then then perpetuate the cycle. Um, and, and you know, I mean, this, there's a similar similarity with with the previous question, the answer about how rather than telling people what to do, be with them and do what to do. Mm. Um, so give give them love, give them time, and when you've given them the time, the first three of the four top tips are listen, listen, and listen. Mm. Yeah. And that often means listening to the silence. Because when someone's really down, they don't really want to talk. Um, but knowing that someone's there for them does something to their heart, mm. does something to their spirit. And after time, you can get a breakthrough. Yeah. It doesn't all have to all have to be discussing, you know, why they're depressed and like they, they shouldn't be depressed, but just helping them to reconnect with what was what was making their soul blossom before. Yeah, because what, for whatever reason that's that started to die. So the seeds never die. The seeds are always there, they just need a bit more watering. What can we do together? And and there's something important about getting in the body. There's something important about eating together. And you know, there's there's enough references in in our history about the importance of doing things together. Um, you know, which has been a theme of our discussion. The okay. other, the other, so, just just two points is in that endeavor, don't drown yourself. Sometimes you have to be able to recognize that you know what I I can't do everything for this person, mm. and you know what maybe I I need to try and signpost them. If they're willing to listen, great. If I can do anything to make it easier, maybe if I can go to the doctors with them, let me do that. But if I can't, then don't try and take control because ultimate control only lives with the being in control. I said, um, I'm so sorry, guys. We're going to, if it's cool, we'll just do like one each because it's, it's like flooding in. Thank you, guys, everyone, for who's, whoever's messaging. Forgive us if we don't get to it. We're going to go for another 50 minutes or so. Um, Sayed Ali, question for you. Okay. I think this is similar to what you were saying as well. Um, there is somewhat a culture of finding comfort in sadness and addiction like social media in today's youth. People don't want to change. What is the first step to changing this? People don't want to change what? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, whoever's messaged, if you want to add more detail, feel free. But generally, from what I presume it means, there's somewhat of a culture of finding comfort in sadness and addiction like a social media. You know how Muhammad Ali was saying about people who take merit to some degree in, in, in sadness. And also, I feel like there's, you know, obviously, you have self-harm, like, uh, trends. Like, I don't mm. know if you guys have seen that, mm. the showing off scars and stuff like that. And it's existed, like, I remember when we were in school, it was like the whole gothic emo thing as well. Um, it, maybe that's to what more of an extreme degree, of course. But at the same time, it, it might be a case of people who um, show off their, like, their grief or their sadness, or who maybe, like, just throw it onto people, uh, maybe at the wrong time or place. I don't know if there is a wrong time or place. Doctor, your thoughts maybe as well. Um, or but, possibly yeah. even like I think maybe also what they're trying to say is don't want to change in that maybe don't want to look for help or maybe you give them advice to say maybe you need to speak to somebody but they don't want to speak to somebody like how I think that's more the question is in how would you navigate that if that's someone that's like close to you or a friend of yours mm -hmm. 
Anything to add, Said? I genuinely didn't understand. Okay, if, whoever sent that question, if you if you would like to, feel free. I, I don't want to give to like, more detail. Wrong advice but, or answer here. Let, let me add one comment. Basic behavioral psychology. Yeah, you do something if it's reinforced. If you get a lot of attention for doing it, you do more of it. So, for so if you want to support someone to change a behavior, don't respond and reinforce the thing that they're doing that you don't like. But find ways of getting them reconnected with the parts of that person that they want to be that you, you you value in them mm. and, and those shared values okay i like that okay cool uh said so, ali i'm going to come back to you yes. uh, my name's yasser nice to meet you yes very nice to meet you uh this one's for the doctor sorry to the rest of you uh doctor i've got a question i just want to ask um it's a two-part question first part is Sometimes, uh, this is not from me, I'm just going to say it's me though. Sometimes um, I get really sad or depressed, let's say. Um, and when I try to sit and evaluate why I'm upset or analyze what's making me so upset, I don't know what it is, but I'm depressed. But I don't know the reason. Second thing is, um, let's say uh, there's a memory that I have that is now that let's say it's 11 years ago, for example, it's still in my mind, it's really minor, but it's kind of haunting me that every time I'm alone or I'm not interacting with anyone, a switch comes on and I remember it over and over and over and over again. How do I overcome that? That's it. Thank you, Doctor. That's a really good question. Yeah. Thank Love you. Uh, if, if anyone wants no, to so chip in, then, then, then please do. So, um, I, I am lost in my depression. Um, I can spend a whole bunch of time trying to figure out how did I get here? That may or may not help me. What's more important is to figure out, well, how do I, how do I move from wherever I am? Because staying where I am is not helping me. Um, there's, you know, lots of theories about how depression develops. Um, but your first kind of approach is, how do I stop what's maintaining the depression? before jumping into you know this deep stuff about where it came from yeah and because that that process in itself is, is hypothetical and it becomes ruminative so you know what are my my three kind of maintenance factors that i need to consider what am i avoiding that i wasn't avoiding before yeah what's happening to my body because depression isn't just in my mind it's in my body and what's happening in my relationships including with with my creator yeah, so just that would be a, a quick fire response to that first point. The second point, I think, comes back to the, you know, something we said about past experiences and how they can traumatize us. Yeah, there, there, there isn't like a, a definition of, oh, you know, you have to reach this threshold to be traumatized. Um, how trauma manifests varies from individuals to individuals. A lot of people with PTSD, for example, that diagnosis is defined by that memory haunting you in a way where you feel you're re-experiencing it. So it could have happened 20 years ago, but boom, when it comes, it's like my heart's racing. I, I can feel in my body, I, I'm transported right back to that moment. It's like it's happening again. Yeah? Now, just because you're not at that level doesn't mean you're not still affecting some effect of traumatization. And any one of us, you know, just that awful conversation when you said something you really shouldn't have said or someone said something, even that can be enough to be like, I can't let go of that. So, you know, when we talked about processing, there's something about being able to discuss it with someone and that whoever you discuss it with has to be trustworthy, has to be objective and has to be a good listener because they don't need to give you the answer always. Just sometimes you verbalizing it is, a, is a, a level of processing that a lot of people have never done because they've just thought about it. When you, and you know, anyone who's a teacher will attest to this, that having knowledge doesn't make you a good teacher. You have to be able to articulate it. Mm. And by articulating it, you're undergoing a level of processing that helps you to understand your material even better. Yeah. Similarly, we can use that natural process that by articulating what we what our memory was and what it means to us to someone, that level of processing can help us make better sense of it. And if we're still stuck, you know what? That person may be able to hold up a mirror to us, ask us a few questions to help us see things differently. That level of processing then ends that repetitive cycle of the memory haunting us. 
That's beautiful. Ahsantum. Thank you very much. I just want a quick uh, intervention from a dear brother. I'm going to say his name. I, d I don't care. I know he's here somewhere. I saw him. Ali Imran, is he here? I don't know. He made a really good point. He DM'd us. He said, Salaamu Alaikum. Just a personal thought. If you look at Surah al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Your Lord has not forsaken you, O Prophet, nor does he hate you. Did he not find you lost and guide you? He says it kind of shows, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but like the reassurance towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad when it was revealed. I think it's a very, very good point on this junction. Um, Sayyid, a question which I think is good for you. Well, I mean, it's addressed to both you and I, but I think this is a good one. What was the point, what was the point Ahmed and Sayyid were referring to uh, about knowing when or if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted our du'as, they never finished it off. Sorry about that. How do we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted our du'as? Yeah, or maybe let's rephrase. Mm. Why has my du'a not been answered already? Oh, this is a long one. The problem is it, it's quite a depth. Yeah. Uh, well, quite in depth answer that's required here. But very, very briefly, you know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have actually answered your du'a. You just don't know it. So First, we have, we, have, we have to understand sometimes what we think is best and we're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we want this, we want to improve this, we want to see this in our lives, but we don't see it. Maybe Allah knows best. You know, you plan and He plans. You want something, He wants something better for you. And you, you may see it as something negative, that dua not being accepted, but there definitely is so much positives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually protected you from answering that prayer. So that's like one perspective that we can see that will help us understand why sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in our opinion, think that he hasn't answered our du'as. Yeah. Said, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like when we, we've done episodes on this. Yeah. I think it was with uh, Brother Ibrahim Ansari. Mm -hmm. Is that the one? Yeah. Shah Ramadan. It's like a timeless episode. So go, go, go back and check it out, guys, if you are interested. Um, as, as it may, maybe the person that asked the question wants to know how does Allah accept our du'as? How does, yeah. I, I think possibly that's what they're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe Muhammad Ali can correct nah, me here and nah. add more value to it, but... There are certain like criteria that we all need to understand that when we supplicate to Allah, there's certain respect that adab. we have to give. There's a certain adab and akhlaq that you have to have with your creator, number one. Firstly, you need to thank him for all that he's given you. You know, sometimes the more gratitude we have, the more understanding that all the blessings that we have in our lives has actually been sourced directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one step towards your dua being accepted. But one of the most important ones is that before you pray for yourself is that you pray for others. And at the same time, you don't just invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather you invoke him with a wasila. And he, as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we have the best examples as that wasila, which is Muhammad and Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihim ajma'in. So always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using their blessed names to inshallah answer your du'a. That's like a very, these very are, brief. And these are these are the blessed nights. Mm. You know, this, this today's the first Jum'ah ah of Rajab and there's yes. there's amal for today. Last night was Laylatul Raqaib. You know, there was the amal for last night in the salah, of course, which we prayed. And in these blessed nights, we have the opportunity to plant the seed as we know ahead of Shah Ramadan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Ad lakum, call upon me and I'll answer you. I think there's, you know, as I learned from Mo Ali, there's the muhkam and the mutashabih. Yeah. Which if you guys want to know what that is, check it out Jamal Nights. But you know, there's the the tr clear and transparent verse of the Holy Quran, and then those are the ones which are more ambiguous and vague. I'm not even going to try and get into it because this is all him. But Allah is not always going to answer us immediately, and that we have to remember that. I'm praying for a two one or for a first. I'm praying for that grad job we talked about, or for my potential engagement to materialize, or something like that, or it could be anything, right? But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not always going to give you what you think you want at that moment. It's it's not always guaranteed. I mean, we can't expect Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as our sustainer, as our creator. We owe He owes us nothing. You know, it's very important for us to remember that. So when we ask Allah, we are, we are pleading to our creator who's sustaining us, who's, who's providing for us. And it may come now. It may come later or it may not come at all. It may be a replacement as we hear a lot, of course, in our lectures. I just um, want to add one final thing to this as yeah, well when it comes to the du'as. And I think it's very important to also, you know, acknowledge that we are doing something to stop that du'a. Yes. And sometimes that is our sins. We may not realize it. It could be, I don't know, interacting daily with something that's not lawful to us. It could be having uh, discussions, conversations that are not lawful to us. Anything that falls out, uh, the falls of Islam, you have to understand that there are certain sins 
that stop your du'as being answered. And we read very famously in Dua al Kumail, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell him what? Oh Allah, forgive us those sins that prevent our du'a from reaching you. So that teaches us something. Do some istighfar. See what sins we are actually doing that are stopping our du'as reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer and make it easier for you. Ahsantum. Ahsantum. I have been instructed that we are now at the end of the discussion. So thank you very much. Firstly, Dr. Safraz, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always give you more tawfiq. You're doing an incredible khidmah service to the community. And I think we should... We all collectively owe you a lot and for those who are doing similar work too. So thank you for being here today. Thank I'm you. sure. Can, where can people find you if they want to reach out or any questions or anything? Uh, my, uh, I'm not that much on socials, but I'm on Doc Sarfraz on Twitter. Doc Sarfraz on Twitter. Fantastic. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Before we wrap up, can I ask everyone, just do me a favor. Can everyone pull out their cellular device, their mobile phone, cellular. please? Um. Unlock your phone or use Face ID. I think or you should have used the phrase smartphone. <laughs> smartphone, yeah. Go over to your YouTube app, please. Type in After Maghrib and smash that subscribe button, please. Everyone in the room, if possible, we are uh, absolutely, I, ho I hope, trying to be consistent. One hour ago, we released, like, as we're sitting here, we released the video called The Knowledge of the Unseen. The Imams have knowledge of the Unseen. Talking about Ilm al Ghaib, where you can see Muhammad Ali talking about Ilm al Ghaib. Um, so every week, just FYI, Thursday nights, Sayyid Ali and I have a conversation on the After Maghrib podcast. It's either ourselves or with a guest. And on the Friday, um, on Jum'ah, we have Muhammad Ali who dissects different issues, um, usually theological or pr primarily theological or qaidi. Um, and he'll go into usually themes over a couple of weeks. So right now we're beginning the first week of the, the imams. Uh, to, why am I saying this? The maqamat of, the imams. of the imams. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it, Ahmed's already explained it very well. Obviously, we're going to try and move into other stuff as well because Jum'ah nights is obviously seen as the, you know, the one where, you know, you pull out the books and then you have to listen like really carefully. So uh, yeah, we're going to try switching up in the, in the weeks to come, inshallah. inshallah. But yeah, make sure you do check out the videos that are already up. We've spoken about loads of different topics and uh, if you find any of them interesting, make sure you check them out. Well, we had some really good videos about the reappearance in relation to Palestine as, and what we spoke about and the things that are happening on the ground and the relation that they have to our classical literature and the Quran. So make sure you guys do check that out if you are interested. No, it's, it's definitely worth it. And I think all of us will learn something, even if it's not something you're kind of into, but if you go through it, you'll get into it. Trust me. 